Hello, everyone. Um, hope everybody's enjoying the evening so far, and I am excited to see everybody, and thank you for attending this meeting. I am now going to share my screen and let me take you on a journey into the waters of the Cretaceous. So first off, I'd like to shout out to Mason for selecting this picture because this is actually how a lot of people think of Mosasaurs as these ancient swimming dragons of the sea, constantly fighting off the small voracious ichthyosaurs. But science has actually told us a much better story. And so I'd like for you to go and come with me on my life aquatic, if you will. Uh, this lecture will actually be talking about some of my ongoing research projects dealing with these wonderful marine reptiles. I like to open up with a quote. The sea, once it, the sea, once it casts its spell, it holds one in its net of wonder forever. And this is a famous quote by Jacques Cousteau, uh, who is a science communicator and marine biologist, and actually a personal hero of mine. This quote is very uh, important to me because I always wanted to maybe pursue something dealing with marine biology, but I decided to pursue paleontology as my science of interest. And then as I grew and started to better understand uh, the ancient rock record, I came across them, a group of the Mosasaurs and got very much interested in them. I got interested in the point where I wanted to pursue graduate school and make these animals my best friends in the academic world and learn about them and become a, uh, an expert in them. Uh, here's actually a picture of me. Uh, it's dated 2014, so I was actually in the middle of grad school this time when I was going out and I was examining different mounts. This one was a mount in the Perot Museum in Dallas, and it's of a mosasaur called Tylosaurus pro rigor, a very uh, popular mosasaur to collect for fossil collectors. So let's go back into the waters. This is actually a picture of our Earth during the late Cretaceous. This was their home and their world. This is a common scene of what the waters may have looked like, say, 80 million years ago during the height of the Western Interior Seaway, a inland ocean that went from the Gulf of Mexico up to Canada. And in these waters, you had an assortment of wonderful life that rivals what we see in our world's biodiversity. In the upper left, you have uh, bony fish, such as Infactinus, long-necked plesiosaurs like Elasmosaurus, giant turtles, you have sharks, you also have uh, different types of cephalopods, ammonites, nautiloids, and then also in the back, preying on a lot of these uh, organisms would be the mosasaurs, a type of marine reptile. And so let's do a little bit of an overview on what a mosasaur is or the essence of mosasauroidae. Mosasaurs are a group of marine adapted squamates. So like our icebreaker asked, are mosasaurs dinosaurs? No, they are not. They're in the group that uh, also contains uh, snakes and rep, uh, lepidosaurs, uh, basically your scaled reptiles. In fact, a lot of studies place mosasaurs as a offshoot of, say, monitor lizards and snakes. This group evolved sometime during the Turonian in the Cretaceous, so around the Middle Cretaceous, and then they went extinct at the end of the Mosozoic. They came into the global um, world as um, starting out as a terrestrial life form. Uh, they, uh, and the closest maybe modern day representative that looks 
very similar to what a proto mosasaur would have looked like could be um, giant lizards. Uh, they could be, um, you know, sailback reptiles um, such as your sailfin iguanas, but basically a basically a land walking reptile. And then sea levels back then, carbonate platforms and sea levels were starting to take over. Sea levels were rising and the opportunity for food and new places to live became available. And they started to transition from these landforms into a semi-aquatic and then eventual fully aquatic um, organism. The first mosasaur remains were actually found in the limestone quarries uh, near the Meuse River. Uh, this was in the Netherlands in 1764. And then uh, these early finds, which some believe, uh, the early uh, biologists believe was some kind of giant crocodile, but eventually the fossil names were eventually named as the famous Mosasaur, Mosasaurus Hoffmanni. These uh, remains were hotly in dispute. Uh, in fact, actually one of the famous stories was that they went from the Netherlands and then were claimed during the French Re Revolution. One of the uh, fanciful um, stories was that the soldiers were actually paid uh, barrels of red wine to be able to go and procure these fossil remains for the French. Uh, but those that are in most of our research, we actually keep it in the Netherlands. Later, you have more Mosasaurs being described. And this was during the time of the famous Cope versus Marsh rivalry, also known as the Bone Wars. And then you also had the famous Sternberg expeditions, which allowed for us to better, which allowed us to better understand the diversity of the Western Interior Seaway in North America. Lots of different species of Mosasaurs, such as the small one to three meter long Cladastes was found during this time. Then you had the medium-sized Mosasaur plate carpus, and then eventually the giant Tylosaurus. These were all found during this time. And we constantly keep knowing and growing about understanding our body of knowledge dealing with these marine reptiles. And then the year is 2015. And the, the idea of a Mosasaur becomes famous again. It was made famous thanks to the Jurassic World movies as seen right up here. In fact, actually that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when the Mosasaur comes up out of the water in the lagoon and grabs the shark. But there's a little bit of a problem dealing with that Mosasaur. It's gigantic. Uh, I think uh, there were some people that started to calculate the size and realized that Mosasaur was easily minimum 60 feet, which is way massive compared to uh, the fossil record of Mosasaurs. The largest Mosasaur remains tend to cap out around 17 meters, so probably in the mid 50 foot range. But it actually took Mosasaurs and put them back into the spotlight. And so Mosasaurs become very um, well known in the public perception and public eye. Uh, fossil collectors actually go out and start actively increasing their collections of Mosasaurs. Some common localities in which Mosasaurs can be found in would be places like the North Sulphur River in North Texas. And in fact, one of my very first Mosasaur fossils, this vertebrae right here, actually came from the North Sulphur Rivers. The Moroccan phosphate beds are well known for Mosasaurs. In fact, Morocco may have been a hotbed of Mosasaur activity as new species are currently under study. And a lot of people are very well at versed in seeing a lot of these teeth from Mosasaurs found at uh, lots of rock and fossil shows, but they are commonly correct, collected in Morocco. And then you also have places on the East Coast, such as the New Egypt and Green Sands formations in New Jersey. And so basically, 
our idea of wanting to know what a Mosasaur is, is dramatically improving year by year. The general public, they, they love Mosasaurs because of the Jurassic World series. Why um, wouldn't you? I mean, after all, it was the, um, one of the cooler animals found in that, mo in that movie series. And uh, one of the best um, climax scenes in that film dealt with the Mosasaur. But I love Mosasaurs because they tell a wonderful story of persistence during times of great changes in the Mesozoic ecosystems. Here is actually a picture of a much more modern reconstruction. This was done by paleo artist Christopher De Piazza, but it shows what the modern Mosasaur would actually look like um, or what Mosasaur researchers think the animals uh, look like. You have scales, which are consistent with that of the monitored lizards, uh, giant robust uh, skulls, body weights uh, that makes this a relatively robust animal. And on the tail, a fluke, which is going to be helping it propel itself through the water for quick ambushes and pursuit of prey items, such as turtles, fish, shark, even smaller mosasaurs. And so let's go on a journey through some of the research projects that I'm currently working on and uh, those that are currently under review that I wish to share with you that tell us more about these wonderful marine reptiles. So right here is actually a framework uh, slide. It's there to talk about uh, the biogeography of the different Mosasaur groups. This was taken from Paulson et al. 2014, where they looked at the global perspectives of Mosasaur groups as they change through time. In the Sinomanian, you start to see that transition from a terrestrial form into an aquatic form. And then Mosasaurs then start spreading out. Uh, you start to see Mosasaur groups uh, heading west along the latitudes. Uh, and begin to enter places like North and South America, along the coast of Africa, uh, but they haven't turned into these massive uh, beasts that you see that arise in the Kodiakian, uh, where you start to see the more common forms, like your Tylosaurus, your Cladastes, Placarpus, and so forth. And then they start to spread out along the globe and uh, attain a global status in the Campanian. And then in the Mastrictian, Mosasaurs can be found in just about every marine to freshwater paleo environment. And so that's actually one of the research questions or projects that I'm in the process of trying to understand. Right here, this is a project that I'm working on. In fact, this is actually a um, going to be a completed work when I finish my capstone research project at the university at uh, West Virginia University. I am currently studying on the graduate level uh, geographic information systems uh, and its relationship and use of big data. So look at I'm looking at giant data sets and using GIS to better interpret the geographic signal of these animals. I'm using published literature, I'm using online databases, and firsthand accounts from fossil collectors. I am uh, using Arc, a program called ArcGIS, which is a uh, free program that allows us to run these larger analysis and play, uh, essentially put these animals on a map. The software is using a data set of at least 1300 entries within my database. Uh, and these 1300 entries are dealing with the site or the location and the situation, the diversity of Mosasaurs. And I've whittled this data, data set down to the smallest units of time that I'm interested in working with. And I'm really wanting to better understand the biodiversity changes in Mosasaurs from the uh, middle to late Campanian, all the way up to the end of the Mastrictian in North America. So really, what are the geologically youngest uh, Mosasaurs doing 
during the Cretaceous. As part of this study, I am utilizing things like globally weighted regression or GWR. It's, it's a statistical test. It's a test that uses user-defined relationships. And I actually have a small uh, list of these different relationships where every single entry goes through a separate statistical equation throughout the study areas. And then it runs them all at once to start to see, start to see what these statistical changes are. Are certain species uh, becoming extinct uh, because of the changing biogeography, or are they actually settling in into uh, different ecosystems? And then I'm using uh, what they call range analysis and I uh, average nearest neighbor. So when I take and finish running GWR, I can actually take the data set and then give it to paleontologists that work exclusively with those formations to say, hey, here are some new fossil sites that you can go and collect it. And if you're looking for mosasaurs, well, you can actually use this map that I've generated using these different methods. And just a visual representation. GIS is a very utilitarian program. Yeah, there's a lot of um, uses for it. Uh, a lot of GIS users tend to work for the National Park Service as forestry agents uh, and public service uh, individuals will actually use GIS to look at things uh, such as uh, trends and uh, distribution of things like um, social economic situations. Uh, but again, it has a lot of utility behind it, and you can actually change a lot of the user-defined settings to work as proxies to any type of research. So again, I'm using this as part of my paleontology research as a way to handle a lot of these larger data sets and start to see what's going on with Mosasaurus. So uh, this is actually an example of a GWR analysis where I actually take uh, user-defined criteria such as taxon, what kind of mosasaur are we looking for? Uh, B1, uh, generally they're gonna look at population, so I switch population with database uh, entries. And again, I have a database of around 1300 entries, and that's generally the bare minimum for these larger data sets because every single entry has to have its own specialized equation. The more equations you can run, the less uh, overlap and noise. You can actually get very precise with these very large data sets. Uh, right here, this one that says income, well, I'm trading income for lithology. What is the primary rock and secondary rock types found in mosasaur bearing locations? As mosasaurs tend to be restricted into marine sediments all the way up into uh, certain kinds of sandstones. And then once you run these different user-defined entries, well, then you get a complete picture. In this case, I'm, being, I'm wanting to look at things like potential size and common taxa found within a region. Uh, some other study areas that I'm actually interested in would be along the East Coast. Um, I'm actually also interested in more interior, late interior seaway. Um, faunas, such as, uh, say, the Pempina Gorge, um, the Hell Creek Formation, which I'll talk more about, uh, really, and all the way down south to, into the Gulf states, like the um, Navarro Formations and the Ozon, just really seeing what is going on for these uh, marine reptiles at the latest uh, time units for them. And so my first um, publication dealing with, uh, seriously dealing with mosasaurs that talks about some of these biogeography changes would actually be the famous Hell Creek mosasaur, which you've probably seen on some news headlines uh, last year. This was done in conjunction with the North Dakota Geological Survey. Uh, my co-author was uh, Dr. Clint Boyd. Uh, and we published on this uh, mid to late 2021, where 
we actually described the first Mosasaur remains found. And uh, we've all heard about the Hell Creek Formation. It's famous for lots of terrestrial dinosaurs, such as your Triceratops, your Tyrannosaurus, uh, Edmontosaurus, but the marine ecosystems are relatively misunderstood. Uh, we do acknowledge that fish and turtles and all sorts of marine organisms lived in those waters, but a mosasaur? That seems very unlikely, but it is actually true. In the region, most mosasaur remains are very fragmentary, and that's one of the reasons why I actually shifted my research from the Gulf up to the north because I really wanted to know what is going on with these very fragmentary forms. Uh, a lot of uh, the fossils of in the Dakotas for mosasaurs tend to come from the older pear shale units or even into the Fox Hills. Uh, these are generally dated to be the Campanian to Mastrichium. Really, the mosasaurs, um, the ecosystems, their biodiversity, based on some of the bio, uh, biogeography and early analysis that I did on the previous project, suggests that these are pliopoly carpine and mosasaurine dominated systems. Really, you get either mosasaurus or you get pliopleticarpus or plecarpus. Uh, Tylosaurus tends to become very rare to practically extinct at uh, those time units. But um, we were still trying to figure out what is going on with these mosasaurs. And then it wasn't until 2016 when the Gerhardt family uh, met Clint and said that they actually found some bones on their property, on their ranch in Morton County. And then Clint was very interested and did some field work and found the uh, fossil material in situ. In situ is geologist for, we found the fossils in place. And the lithology, when Clint actually did, went out there and started to look around, found that the rock units were very characteristic of deltaic sandstones, uh, shales, um, and they had lots of index fossils, trace fossils, in fact, that pinpointed where in position uh, these fossils were sitting and that they actually came from the burying member, which is a uh, marine member of the Hell Creek Formation. So the Hell Creek Formation had these uh, deltas and river channels that were rather large and that they could support a large mosasaur. And so this research, contributes to the body of knowledge of the Hell Creek Formation, because the Hell Creek Formation is believed to be kind of an end of a line uh, view of the interior seaway as it was starting to shrink. It was starting to disappear. The, those waters, those open marine waters that supported the Mosasaurs earlier in geologic time were disappearing, a shrinking east ecosystem, something we don't see on the Atlantic seaboard or along the Pacific coastline. And so this actually proposes a really good um, idea because seeing these um, habitats are starting to become closed off, how are these large bodied mosasaurs surviving uh, when the mosasaurs on say the Pacific coastline or the Atlantic that are actually out in the open ocean are suffering from things like the strange love ocean effect that occurred in the uh, latest Mistricti and that started to cause the marine ecosystems to collapse. Uh, so I find that was actually a very good way to segue this project forward and start describing this animal. Uh, right here, you actually see what they call the pygal vertebrae. Uh, these are um, part of the backbone, kind of around the hip, um, these would have held the tail on. And we figured out that the uh, vertebrae and the section jaw, which will be on the next slide, all came from the same animal. However, they had uh, characteristics that were common in just about every group of the mosasaurids. And so we needed to be a little bit more specific in our identification because this was rather groundbreaking and no mosasaur has formally been reported 
in the literature. And we really wanted to make sure that, first off, was this actually Mosasaur? And which Mosasaur are we actually dealing with? So we go into the literature. We look at uh, books like Russell 1967, which this is the Mosasaur um, textbook uh, that basically every Mosasaur researcher uses in their studies because it gives a really good write-up on species level diagnosis and the anatomy of these animals. And so we started to compare that along with the medial reflection of what they call the retroarticular process, basically the back end of the jaw that we collected. We found out that the shape and the presence of a large glenoid fossa in the lower jaw and all the other characteristics along with characteristics found on the vertebrae actually lean it towards the group of Mosasaurinae. Uh, so that would have been removed the uh, Pliopodic carpine group, and then it would have also removed the Tylosaurs. So it, we're looking at basically the big robust forms of the late Cretaceous for Mosasaurs. But that got us into the ballpark. I really want to know more about what the possible candidates are for us calling it a Mosasaurinae. Uh, so I actually looked at the metrics. Now, metrics is just really just looking at the statistics. Um, and there was actually a really good paper just called uh, et al. 2019, where they actually scored a lot of uh, Mosasaur remains based on things like length, the lithologies, uh, taphonomic completeness, how complete is the specimen, uh, qualitative, quantitative, and um, uh, statistically, our specimens fell in line with uh, two types of mosasaurs. You had uh, Mosasaurus hoffmani, which was the big, large, global mosasaur uh, species, and then you also had Prognathodon overtoni which is another large body form. Uh, this picture right here just shows us the comparisons between uh, Prognathodon and Mosasaurus for the lower jaw uh, man, uh, post uh, mandibular unit. And I've actually circled out uh, the glenoid fossa, which is found in a diagnostic trait for all of the Mosasaurinae. So if you're either the small cladastes all the way up to these giant mosasaurus and prognathodon, you're going to have a glenoid fossa on your jaw. And these, and this glenoid fossa is just there to help anchor a lot of these robust jaw muscles in which it used for prey handling. This table right here represents the uh, statistics, uh, basically comparing what we saw in Driscoll et al., uh, a little bit of the biogeography from Paulson et al. 2014, along with our specimen down here at the bottom. Our sample size was two. Mosasaurus Hoffmani actually had the largest of the, uh, the sample size. When we compared the length of our Hell Creek Mosasaur, we got an estimated total length of about 11 meters, which is larger than Mosasaurus uh, Conodon at 10 meters, uh, larger than Mosasaurus Missouriensis at 8.5 meters, still bigger than Plotosaurus, Plesiotylosaurus, both of the Prognathodons, and Amiriosaurus, but it's not as large as the largest species of Mosasaurus, Hoffmani. And then we also uh, compare the TCM. So this is going to be the taphonomic completeness, completeness, excuse me, uh, metric, which is how complete is the specimen? And well, our numbers were relatively low. The Mosasaurus uh, TCM uh, was relatively hot, um, matched our uh, numbers. And then the qualitative completeness metric also fell within ours. Uh, so uh, red represents uh, the statistics that don't match our specimen and the green is a much closer match. And interesting note, uh, prognathodon rat packs and prognathodon overtoni 
uh, they had very similar signal. And so that tells me at this time that maybe, maybe over tonight and rap hacks could have been actually the same uh, organism. And so based on the statistics, based on the morphology, chances are the Hell Creek Mosasaur was either Mosasaurus hoffmani the, or uh, a prognathodon. And right here is a artist reconstruction of our Hell Creek Mosasaur as he's or she swimming the uh, what's left of the interior seaway. Uh, the Dakota Isthmus is starting to form. And uh, there is a very brave Edmontosaurus trying to cross the open waters. Uh, we suggest we think that the reason why this large body mosasaur uh, survived for such a uh, during its life was probably uh, snacking on dinosaurs uh, that wandered too close to the water's edge, along with the usual prey items a mosasaur would consume. But how did it die? A giant organism would um, have to have a place to live. And we proposed in the paper that it probably died as a result from the last recession of the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. Really the formation of the Dakota Isthmus closed off its ecosystem. And then the waters uh, essentially receded to the point where this poor mosasaur probably beached itself. And seeing it's a marine critter and used to living in the water, take it out of water, it's gonna have a bad time. And then the isolated animal, along with the uh, leftovers of the fauna of the Fox Hills formation that was also present, uh, made it a very isolated and strained ecosystem. And then eventually that mosasaur, it died um, along this shoreline. Scavengers uh, would have then uh, picked the carcass clean uh, along with maybe a, a random uh, dinosaur uh, scavenging, say, Tyrannosaur or the, the pterosaurs that flew over the Hell Creek, uh, would have, again, picked the specimen clean. So that's why we have um, very little fragment uh, and highly fragmentary fossils of this specimen. It's just the corpse was just picked apart. But enough was left behind to say, hey, this animal was here. This is a, another research project that I'm uh, actually got currently uh, getting ready to go into review right now. And this is actually a thread of data that I collected back when I was doing my thesis research on Mosasaurus, uh, particularly Tylosaurus, uh, for my master's degree at the University of Texas of the Peruvian Basin. But, um, this paper actually deals with utilizing uh, new technologies to better understand mosasaur behavior. You see, mosasaurs, their behavior is, is very similar to that of modern day uh, monitors. Uh, we can actually, because of their uh, close relationship. The fossil remains that I was working on during my master's degree uh, was um, mosasaur remains that were collected at the border of Ness and Trago counties in Kansas. So it would have been part of the Smoky Hill chalk member, which is present in the base to the lower middle of the Niobrara formation. And how we identified that is just by looking at um, marker units that were published in the literature, basically if you find a particular type of inoceramid clam, chances are you're within these certain marker units. And we found it and we got this mosasaur skeleton. It was uh, relatively flat fragmentary, it wasn't all complete, but we were working with the specimen, preparing it out um, for study and found that there was a tooth embedded in the splenal. Now the splinter I have highlighted in the mount on the bottom right, but I've actually got a nice cast. And this cast actually came from the Canadian Discovery Center in Manitoba. And I'd like for everybody to uh, meet Clyde the Clydastes. But the uh, splinter is actually the hinge that would attach the dentary 
um, to the rest of the posterior mandibular unit or the back lower jaw. When we were working with a specimen, we noticed that there was a tooth embedded into it. Uh, the tooth was bedded in such an angle that it was that none of the bone surface would have been exposed externally. These would have been bones that um, would have either had cartilage and muscle sitting on top of it, or really no angle that a tooth could have been placed there. My advisor at the time believed that this was placed in the splenal by forceful interaction by another larger tylosaurus. In fact, we see this in the fossil record quite a few times. Uh, there is plenty of tylosaurs uh, that are found in Kansas uh, that have bitten snouts. There's mosasaur specimens where there's, um, there's been bite marks found in the quadrate, which is the hinge on the back lower jaw. Uh, there's mosasaurs in the fossil record where even the flippers have been amputated in fights with other mosasaurs. Uh, and even broken necks. And so my advisor was like, yeah, this is just a example of a Mosasaur on Mosasaur conflict. But honestly, as any good paleontologist, we have to be skeptical about what is being presented and uh, as dynamic evidence. And so took the splenal and took it to the local hospital and ran it through a x-ray machine. Uh, and did computerized tomography uh, to a CT scanning. Put, uh, and we got to see the interior of that splenal. Uh, we generated around 600 slices, each slice consisting of 0.5 millimeters. So we basically took that bone, cut it up into small segments, and then looped them together. So that way we can see the, um, the internal and external morphology of that bone. And because of the data, we took the slices and rendered it into a 3D model for future studies. And in fact, once this paper comes out, you too can actually download the model and then put it through a 3D printer and actually have your own splenal with a tooth embedded into it. The model was actually later submitted as a plasteotype. Um, and we can continue our studies onto it. So here's actually a picture of the splenal. It's very diagnostic to that tylosaurus. So when you combine it with the rest of the skeleton that was working on during my master's thesis, um, this and the uh, stratigraphic location of the tylosaur, you can actually uh, place this as one of the early tylosaur species called Tylosaurus kansasensis which lived in a weird overlap in time uh, with Tylosaurus nepiolicus and also the earlier Tylosaurus proriger. So the brown represents the uh, images of the actual fossil and then the white is the 3D model of the splenal. And right here you can see the tooth. Now this part of the splenal um, this, uh, this groove right here, you would have had like muscle and cartilage sitting on top of it. So this was all interior right here. You would have had, uh, this is the Makel's canal. So you would have had blood vessels passing through it. So really highly improbable that this tooth would have been placed in this groove. Um, a lot of the teeth that are embedded into bones of mosasaurs are actually uh, more on the external faces of the bones. And so with the preliminary results, and we just started looking at the bones and realized and justified that uh, both the internal and external examination, it really actually didn't reveal any potential differences in the T. cancer nepiolicus and pro rigor taxonomy because a splenal, it's only diagnostic to the subfamily. And teeth in mosasaurs um, outside of, say, your rounded globidins and corinidins and some of the broader mosasaur groups, a lot of times they're not super diagnostic. They have a utility to them, but um, tooth taxonomy is variable within the different clades. 
We also looked at how the CT picked up on the mineral intrusions found within the bone. Um, after all, this bone uh, sunk to the bottom of the interior seaway, sediments uh, that are calcium rich covered it up and actually in, uh, intruded into the bone. And we started to look at that and noticed that there really also wasn't a lot of crushing internally like you would see in a fight between a large and between two large animals. And so this kind of was like, hey, maybe something wasn't adding up. And then we also looked at modern analogs and fossil record and proposed that maybe the, um, the Mosasaur in which the splenol actually belonged to may have already been dead. And then when it had died, the corpse disarticulated in the water column. And so maybe a larger Mosasaur did come along and mess with the corpse. Or a much more simpler explanation is that the body uh, decayed, sunk down to the bottom of the interior seaway, and then another large mosasaur may have swam over it. And mosasaurs, they tend to shed their teeth on a regular basis. And so maybe that tooth did uh, get shed, fell down into that dentary groove, sediment, and time just compacted in there to make it look like it was some kind of mosasaur on mosasaur interaction. And so maybe the predation narratives found in the fossil record might not be as truthful as those that wish it were. And we've seen this before in other fossil groups. For example, there are fossil whales where they've actually have like fish stuck up their nose when they died. Um, there's that. There's uh, countless examples of dinosaurs where they get weird teeth jammed into parts of the body that it's very impossible to reach to, depending on the size and taxon of the dinosaur. And also when you think about it, the bottom of the interior seaway, it probably had a lot of dead and decaying organisms at the bottom of it. I mean, when something dies, it bloats, floats, sinks. And so this time I'd like to open the floor for any questions and answers um, that you may have about Mosasaurs. And in fact, actually, this is a picture of me uh, teaching Geology 101 during the COVID-19 pandemic with Clyde, the Clyde Estes, um, where we uh, actually teach uh, at the college uh, Geology Online. Um, so that is it. Uh, that's some of the latest and greatest that I'm currently working on. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. So yeah, if you guys have questions, uh, if you could put them into the chat or if you could uh, use the hand raising function or something and uh, we can unmute you so you can talk to him directly, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, first, I did have a question earlier uh, from Jeff who asks, uh, do we know anything about the speed of Mosasaurs? Uh, swimming speed, um, it varies from Mosasaur to Mosasaur. Like, for example, Mosasaurus, I don't think was really a big, speedy swimmer. Uh, it was probably like um, a big open ocean cruiser. Um, but Tylosaurus may have been more ambushed and could actually generate some speeds with its fluke. Um, so speed is relatively uh, hard to determine for these kind of animals, I think. Um, but interesting story, in the Pro Museum in the basement, they actually have it where you can do a foot race against a Tylosaurus. And um, yeah, I became a Tylo snack pretty easily. Uh, and Erico asks here, is there any record of how often Mosasaurs cannibalize the smaller ones? So like interspecies uh, cannibalization. Um, the, how often, um, well, if that larger Mosasaur is hungry, he's going to go after it. Um, 
there's um, actually at the Sternberg Museum, there's actually a really nice Tosaurus Pro Rigger uh, stomach cavity that actually has uh, a tail of a smaller Claudastes into it uh, as it was sitting in the stomach. Uh, next question comes from Olivia who asks, what was the bite force of a Mosasaur? Good question. There's actually a research paper that is uh, currently in the works uh, dealing with that. Uh, that's not um, a question that I'm really fluent about scoring a number on. All right. Uh, Trevor asks, uh, is there any trauma in, around the tooth embedded in the splenial, uh, perhaps a pathology, or, or what would you expect if, there, if it had uh, actually uh, attacked it? If it was actually actively atta uh, attacked, I probably would have seen more internal crushing of the bone, like the spongy bone would have actually been almost obliterated. Uh, all we saw was basically external cracking, which is consistent with the taphonomic process. The apex of that tooth is just split right down the middle, uh, probably along the usual breakage lines that a lot of Mosasaur teeth have. Um, so really, if that thing was actually Mosasaur on Mosasaur, I would have wanted to probably see something that was a lot more beat up. Uh, Barry asks, what's the difference between a large pliosaur and, uh, and mosasaurs? Is it the long tail? So uh, pliosaurs and mosasaurs, yeah, they actually have uh, what they call evolutionary convergence, basically big head, long snut, um, and paddles. Um, mosasaurs, they, when they became aquatic, they tended to adapt for more... Um, a different swimming uh, style. Uh, it they swim kind of like a cog or eel, uh, kind of moving there around the uh, ocean like that. But um, there's lots of uh, smaller characteristics on the morphology of the bones that actually separates them out. Uh, pliosaurs, their body plan is really just that of the short neck plesiosaur scaled up. Mosasaurs, more snake and monitor like. All right. Uh, Jim asks, how long could a mosasaur hold its breath? Do we have any ideas to that? I do not. Um, probably maybe something like our um, whales and dolphins. Uh, it's very hard to gauge. I mean, these are, we don't really have a lot of soft tissue lungs of mosasaurs, if any. Uh, Robert asks, how do you tell the difference between mosasaurus and tylosaurus? Uh, the snoot, uh, the tylosaurus, the big defining diagnosable characteristic for tylosaurus is the long uh, protruding premaxillary snoot. Um, in fact, actually, that's how it got one of its earlier names of being rhinosaurus, because uh, they believe that it used that to disorientate its prey by spearing it. But now we believe that is a uh, incorrect uh, prey handling behavior. It just basically has a longer snoot. Now, tylos uh, now mosasaurus has a bigger blockier skull, much larger teeth as uh, Trevor actually is well known for. Is that correct, Trevor? Uh, yeah, I studied the teeth. <laughs> so. uh, Chris asks, that he said that uh, he heard you say second jaws. Do Mosasaurs have more than one row of teeth? In fact, they actually do. The pterygoids are uh, very unique and in fact, actually a uh, characteristic which puts mosasaurs in the squamate group. Uh, snakes have these uh, uh, second set of jaw uh, teeth. Uh, you also see them in monitor lizards. Um, but yeah, these are great for grabbing onto your prey and then helping pull it down into the digestive tract. Because after all, they've got paddles. They can't move food into their mouth. That's absolutely terrifying. Uh, what is your favorite fossil uh, mosasaur specimen, asks Wyatt. My favorite mosasaur fossil specimen, that's actually a tough one. Uh, probably the Hell Creek mosasaur is probably my favorite, just because it's like, hey, it puts it on the map as at, but uh, historically, uh, I'm probably gonna have to go with Bunker. The, uh, 
No, actually, Bruce in Manitoba, the giant Telosaurus pembinensis, uh, which is actually the longest of the uh, published uh, Tylosaurus specimens. All right, next, uh, uh, Michelle asks, were all Mosasaurs solitary animals or were there their group hunting techniques? Um, very hard to judge that behavior. I, I suspect that probably um, the younger Mosasaurs probably kind of banded together, uh, but then once they hit a full size or adulthood, they probably just went off and did their own thing all the way up until it was breeding season, and then they would pair up, do the deed, and go off their separate ways. Uh, related question from with that. Uh, a related question from Robert Fonderson: Do you have an idea of the lifespan of Mosasaurs? Uh, very hard to say, but um, if Mosasaurs grew uh, mysometrically, basically the older the Mosasaur, the larger it is, then maybe the larger specimens that are probably 13 meters plus tend to, may have actually been older animals. Uh, but we really don't have a good handle on the numerical lifespan of Mosasaurs. Uh, it's not like we have a good record like Tyrannosaurus Rex, for instance, or Triceratops. And, uh, so Mike, has, sorry, so, you has, so has no one ever counted the 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 ring the rings like you do on a tree, or you can you can do that. Um, but th these animals are living also in marine systems where the geochemistry can actually make change these rings. Like you mean change the number of rings in the bone? Uh, make them not um, as visible. Uh, Mike asks, would you expect their, their general behavior to be sim more similar to like sharks or to dolphins? Like if we're looking for a modern analog, uh, what would we look for? I probably would pr pick a good, uh, for at least their hunting style, I probably would go maybe for something like an orca. In fact, they've actually published papers where they looked at the structure internally and externally of some of the pre-maxilla and maxillae uh, in mosasaurs. And um, some of the speculation is that they may have been basically like our big hunting whales and dolphins. Um, but um, behavior-wise on interactions, I would just lump that in with the giant monitors. Very irritable, but awesome. And uh, uh, Br Bronwyn asks, do we get uh, mosasaur fossils in Maryland? We actually do. Uh, that is actually a small side project I'm helping contribute with. And I am just going to say, wait for the paper. Yeah, that'll be cool. Uh, and I, I have a question, um, and I'm not sure if this is something that, that anyone could really answer uh, unless you had like isotopes or something, but uh, do, do you think that mosasaurs would have traveled long distances in oceans or would they stay within their uh, kind of basins? Um, they actually probably would travel great distances, especially uh, the larger ones for mosasaurs. You got to go where the food is. Um, but there's actually been a lot of isotope studies that came out probably in the last, say, uh, 10 years, where they've actually looked at the isotopes within the teeth and the bones and realized that a lot of these mosasaurs, they actually would hang out in different uh, niches um, in the water column, like your big uh, mosasaurus Hoffman, I may have preferred at the height of the interior seaway, living out in the open oceans. Whereas your smaller Calidastes would probably want to be more comfortable closer to the shorelines. And Tylosaurus probably uh, preferred uh, a vari variation between the two. And then pla um, Plyoplated Carpus, because it has a very complex internal ear structure, may have actually wanted to uh, be in the deeper waters. That's really cool. Uh, and, and Mike asks, uh, is there any sexual dimorphism uh, difference between these sexes that we can determine? Um, probably would have to look in the literature for at like modern analogs, but I suspect maybe it's just how robust the bones are. Um, but sexual dimorphism in some fossil reptiles is a little variable uh, and uh, more of a 
relic of the older days of paleontology. Uh, Bronwyn asks, uh, do movies like Jurassic World employ paleontologists, like consulting paleontologists uh, to, to figure out how uh, big these animals were? And did they like drop the ball on this one for uh, Jurassic World? They dropped the ball onto it, but I like the movie so much that I'm, I'm, I'm letting it slide. But um, we need to go and actually look more at the fossil records, look at the percentages of the skulls, uh, just look at overall. Um, really, we, sh we are going to be going through a sizing renaissance, if you will. Uh, do you have something to say, Trevor? Uh, yeah. So everybody, oh, okay. Allie doesn't want to hang out. <laughs> oh, uh, one question. What sure. makes you think Pognathodon, Rapax, and Overton are the same? Um, it's just the overlap in their uh, the uh, their ranges and uh, you know shape of some of their quadrates. It's just and that and I believe um, Rapax was diagnosed on like a really terrible vertebrae. And nothing be more diagnostic. So, um, but that's currently being worked on by other researchers. But overall, I I would lump the two together. Interesting. Thanks. Anyone else with any uh, last minute questions here? Um, going back to behavior, um, I still someone asked if. If behavior you say would be more familiar to sharks or dolphins, but uh, I did have um, one question, and it may you may have the same answer. Um, has there been evidence of breaching behavior as shown in Jurassic as shown in Jurassic World and like great white sharks? Um, because I, um, I know some depictions have shown mosasaurs breaching up and bringing down pterosaurs like Tyrannodon. I think it's plausible. Okay. Which require a lot of work, but I think why not? Yeah, and I can also say we have uh, definitely, we have sharks doing that. Uh, like our larger, even basking sharks are known to do that on occasion. So, uh -huh. uh, so uh, definitely plausible. I think that's, that's it. Uh, in terms of questions here. We thank you so much uh, for coming out to speak to us again. It's always a pleasure. And that was a wonderful presentation as everyone is saying in the comments. Uh, so thank you so much.